topic that we'll be discussing will be the issue of preservation. Uh, inspiration really isn't anything that is um, controverted or rather that is argued. Uh, no one really argues whether or not God actually gave his word, which is usually what is covered with um, the idea of inspiration. But it's preservation that a lot of people usually have an issue with or rather maybe have uh, a limited understanding with regard to whether or not actually God promised to preserve his word or whether you know it's actually preserved. Do we, do we have God's word today? Is it something that when I go to my Bible that I'm confident that I have what God told you know Moses or the generations past uh, even as far back as Abraham or even you could say Job or Adam we have God's word today. In other words, can I take my Bible and stake my life on it? Um, it's what instructs me with regard to not just, yeah, obviously daily living, but with regard to just eternity. It instructs me what, what I'm, about God himself. Um, outside of, and it's, he's not beyond this, but <laughs> outside of just him like physically directly revealing himself to me, Basically, what I'm going to have is, you could say, second or third hand witness. But uh, because I'm not personally an eyewitness to when Jesus was physically here alive, um, or back in the wilderness wanderings uh, when God revealed Himself to the nation of Israel, um, I have the recorded accounts. And so, can I rely on that? Can I trust that? In other words, is it something? that because this is what I know or this is what instructs me about God and what I know about eternity about eternal life um, you know can I rest on that so that's hopefully what I uh, am planning to answer this morning or rather that's I am planning on answering that this morning uh, and throughout the series uh, hopefully I do a good enough job with it but preservation Okay, so we start off, is preservation a Bible doctrine? Is it something beyond just a preference or a nice idea, but is it actually taught in the Bible? In other words, did God promise to preserve his word? Did he give specific statements in his word, throughout his word, that specifically commit his character to the keeping of his word or preserving his word? Uh, turn to Psalm be Psalm 126. Psalms 12. Psalms 12. 12 Psalm. Right. We'll read the whole of it and then we'll focus on the last uh, verse 6 and 7. Mm -hmm. To the chief musician upon Shemneth, a psalm of David, help Lord for the godly man Cephas, for the faithful fail from among uh, the children of men. They speak vanity every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Um, who have said, with our tongue uh, will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is the Lord upon us? Or who is Lord upon us? Or who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. And the, words of the, or the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. All right. This is David speaking, and then he's crying out to God. In particular, we see verse 1, uh, the godly man ceaseth here. Faithful fail from among the children of men. So he's making 
a plea to God, and then he asks, or he states rather in verse 3, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. And he gives example of what they would say. Who hath said, With our tongue we will prevail, our lips our own. Who is Lord over us? So the proud man, the ungodly man, the one that rises himself up, not just against David, but against God himself. Um, and verse 5, uh, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. So now God is going to respond, not only just to David's cry, but for the need, the actual neediness of the folks that are being oppressed or opposed by the ungodly man. And then he makes a statement here. Now, in context, he's referencing what is being said. Um, just so we know, okay? In context, he's referencing what is being said is that God's going to arise. He's going to defend the one that is needy. He's going to set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Um, the words of, and then, you know, he says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Um, in context, he's referencing what God stated he's going to do. In principle, there is a truth here, and that is God states, and then he is going to keep, he's going to follow through. Um, we'll look at a few, we're actually going to look at a lot more passages, but God made a statement, and he's going to follow through, he's going to keep it. So, God spoke, and his words, he states, are pure. Uh, David notes them, keeps them, they're pure. They're, they're, his words are pure. His words, he also calls them as being truth, not only just in Psalms, but in Proverbs, we see that God's words uh, would be considered as truth. Thy word is truth, as what uh, Jesus said with regard to, uh, to to God and God's word. Go to Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter one. Start in verse 13. <clears throat> okay, yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, speaking of his body, uh, to stir up by putting you in remembrance, or stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must uh, put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. In other words, this is Peter speaking um, to believers. He's, he's speaking to the basically to the Jewish believers that are spread abroad. Uh, he's writing to them in particular to stir them up or to bring into remembrance certain teachings and instruction that he was given uh, so that because he is getting ready to basically die. Uh, John 21, Jesus had approached Peter to restore him after he had fallen, basically going back to go fishing, uh, after he had denied Christ uh, when he was taken to basically, to the high council. Um, after that, you know, Peter goes back to fishing. Jesus, after his resurrection, uh, approaches Peter, uh, and then, well, at the, at, at the scene, when they're at the Sea of Tiberias, and then so he approaches him, he comes, they have their conversation, he restores him. Um, he well, actually calls him to go feed a sheep. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that, he tells Peter the means by which he's going to die, which is he'll be crucified. In fact, that, that's how he's going to glorify God is he's going to die. So Peter at that point says to uh, the Lord, you know, well, what about him? Speaking of John, he pointed to John, and then Jesus says about John, well, what if it, what if, if it were my will for him to live? Uh, not granted, I'm not paraphrasing him. These are verbatim, but he basically said, okay, what if, if, if it were my will for him to go ahead and live? You know, till I return, and then at that point it says, uh, in parentheses or in excursions that, okay, after that it was sounded abroad that John was going to go ahead and live till Jesus returned, but 
that was the point. So he's at that point addressing him, you know, what is it to you whether or not, you know, my will is for him to live or not, you know, you follow me. Um, so he's referencing the fact that he was stated, or he, it was stated to him by, by the Lord that he's going to live, or excuse me, he's going to die. And so now it's nearing his actual time of death, uh, he feels, and so he's writing this to put into remembrance. Uh, verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may, excuse, ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Uh, what things? The things I guess he's got to, ready to share with them. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For ye received from God the Father honor and glory, um, or excuse me, for, for he received from God the Father honor and glory, uh, when there came such a voice to him uh, from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, and we were with him in the holy mount. Now this is referencing the transfiguration of the Lord when he was um, basically the mount. And you have Peter, James, and John, that were with Jesus at that time, and then you have Moses and Elijah that appeared as well. Peter says, it's good for us to be here, let's make tabernacles that we may remain up here, and then Jesus, or excuse me, and then you have the voice say, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I will please, you know, hear ye him. And so he identifies Jesus as being, well, he's the one that you worship, not the others, you know. and. Uh, from that point, uh, you know, Jesus would go back down with them, but it wasn't the fact that they're to remain there. Um, but he saw Jesus manifest his glory as God, not just in the miracles, but literally physically with James and John there at that mount. And so he was an eyewitness, uh, is what he stated here. And then he says, verse 19. Uh, which is pretty interesting. It says, We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, uh, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Note, um, he distinguishes his personal first-hand eyewitness account of seeing Jesus manifest his glory and transfigured before him, along with James and John on that mount, with what he terms here as a more sure word of prophecy. All right? So this word of prophecy, or in particular what would be scripture, is what he terms as more sure. Or in other words, it's more reliable. It's more trustworthy than his personal first-hand eyewitness uh, account of seeing Jesus transfigured before him along with James and John on the mount. Now, why in the world would that be? It, it, it actually tells us a little bit later here. It tells us in verses 20 21. But it, basically, it's the word of prophecy is reliable, and it's more sure that even this first hand account, even though his first hand account would be reliable, because it's recorded for us, <laughs> right? Uh, is because God gave it. In other words, God, God, gave, God gave the word. Now, understood in that, he says here that it's given, but understood is that he states we have it. Okay? Now, by extension, we do too, but he's giving to his audience who, uh, by this time, how many years removed are they from that account? About 35. Say that again? 30, 40. 30, 30, 40 years, 30, 35, 40 years roughly, <clears throat> from when the actual account transpired. 
Now they would have had it, but by extension also we do too. But he stated, this is almost pedantic, I know. But yeah, I'm not trying to be insulting to anybody, but the fact is, he stated that they had it, okay? And it's more sure, and it's more sure because it was given by God. Um, they had it, and it's reliable, okay? Point being, you could want to attack, and we'll see here also, not in this particular passage, but we'll see in a few others that even during the time that Paul was writing to the churches, in particular to Corinth, uh, but not exclusively also to Corinth, uh, was that folks were writing false, not just teaching, but also false, I guess you could say manuscripts, or writing letters to the churches in Paul's name that weren't, I guess, inspired or that weren't authorized by Paul to be written. And so the devil was at work in trying to bring about confusion and to undermine the credibility of not just prophecy and the word of God, but also our confidence in these words and the confidence in the fact that we have a reliable source by which we can stake our lives on and know God and know truth by him. Uh, we see here, God gave it, they had it. Right? So, um, it's understood, even though it's not, well, it is kind of somewhat explicitly, but the fact is, he didn't use the term, okay, he preserved it, but it was kept for them. They had it. Peter gave weight to it, saying that it's more sure. In other words, it's more trustworthy than. I'm sorry, we're in Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. It's more trustworthy than even his own personal firsthand eyewitness. And you have it; you can rely on it. And then we'll look at verses. He says, verse 19 of it. You would do well that you take heed to it. In other words, it's beneficial for you to listen to it, to, to obey it, uh, to live by it. Now, in verse 20, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, uh, for the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. All right. It's of no private interpretation. So in other words, when a person is born again and has the Holy Spirit imputed into them once they're born again can open up the Word of God study it and read it um, if they're instructed by God then they're going to arrive at the same conclusion that say another believer would uh, that opens it up and is honestly seeking God in other words it's not one man's opinion over another man's opinion it's not one man's, uh, I guess, what we, how we use the term interpretation of what we think God said, but rather, mm -hmm. in other words, God plainly laid out truth and expressed himself, communicated what he wanted to communicate. And when you come to the Word of God with an open heart, wanting <coughs> truth, God will communicate it to you. It's, not, it's, it's, it's a no private interpretation. In other words, I will arrive at the conclusion or truth I'm open to it, what God said, and so will another believer. Does that make sense? In other words, you're... Truth, yeah, obviously there's going to be divisiveness in it, but the fact is there's a standard, there's an objective standard by which you can look to and guide your life by. It's, of, it's not skewed by a certain man's opinion. Now we know that obviously people take the word of God and pervert it. Uh, we know that people take teachings from the Word of God and twist things uh, for their gain or to just basically as a tool of Satan to lead people astray, mm -hmm. uh, to get people to veer off so that it undermines uh, what God's trying to do in their life and basically destroys the work that God wants to do in their heart. Uh, but the fact is, 
clearly states there's no private interpretation in words. I should be able to arrive at the truth, and I'll know that I've arrived at the truth from the Word of God. I come to it with an open heart. The reason why he states here is that uh, it came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved, or literally they were borne along uh, by the Holy Ghost. So God used men, in particular it says holy men, and the idea there is that these were men that were set apart. Note, what, who were some of the men that God used to pen the scripture? And that preserve it for us. Sorry? Moses? Moses was one. David. And David was another one. Peter, Paul, Matthew, Solomon, John. about 40 of them. Yeah. Moses. Okay. Now, some of them had concurrent life, lifetimes or lifespans. In other words, uh, that's not how you appropriately say it. In other words, some of them lived parallel with each other as far as along the same life, but there was a pretty big span of when some of these lived. Education level of some of them also differed. Uh, some, as if when you read in the book of Acts, in particular of Peter uh, and John, it states that these are unlearned men. Uh, it wasn't that they weren't intelligent, but they weren't educated. In other words, they weren't brought up in letters. They weren't. In other words, they, they, they didn't really have much of school training, you could say. Uh, it wasn't that they weren't bright men, uh, rather, but even if they weren't, <laughs> I really don't know that. Uh, but the fact is, I, I would say I would venture to say they were they had some obviously capacity to do things. They 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 owned their own business. They were fishermen. They, had, they obviously were able to make a good livelihood at it. So I would say, okay, you know, you're not you're not dumb. That's what we would be considered. But the fact is, he had a very different pedigree than say Apostle Paul. And a good portion of the New Testament and would have sat at the Fed of Gamaliel and he had a far greater education level than a good number of the writers, uh, barring maybe like Isaiah, uh, which Isaiah would have had a really good, and, well Moses as well, uh, grew up in Pharaoh's house. Nonetheless, okay, you have these men, okay, varying education levels, you have uh, already was mentioned with David and Moses, both of whom were murderers and David in particular uh, was an adulterer. Uh, polygamist. Now, mind you, after the fact, <laughs> this isn't an issue of like, okay, before he became a believer in God, but this was after the fact. Okay, that's like, that blows my mind. Here, um, Proverbs 31. <laughs> if you could imagine this. Uh, Proverbs 31, as stated, obviously it was written down by Solomon, but according to the prophecies that his mother had given him, who was his mother? Would have been Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Okay. <laughs> Humanly speaking, would you look to her to learn how to be a godly wife? Yes. I mean, no. I mean, like that's kind of like, oh, okay, that's kind of intense to think about. But barring all this, the fact is. These are some of the people that God used, but we see that it states here, okay, it came not by the will of men, and it states in particular of them that they were holy. All right? What is that distinguishing characteristic? Okay, in particular, holy is being, Hagia says that you're set apart. In other words, that you, not only, I'll give, uh, you, not only that you were chosen by God for a specific task, but in other words, you set yourself apart. You took the personal initiative to seek God, open your heart, surrender to Him. God, use me. All right. So these were men that were committed, that wanted God's will in their life, sought God's will in their life, and sought to apply, I guess, as consistently as possible. Though obviously we know that not all the writers of, or the, the penmen that God used were uh, 
obviously perfect, uh, as, we, as we would count perfect. But they were holy. They set themselves apart. They were set apart, and they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So in other words, they were a vehicle. They left themselves open as a vehicle for God to move so that they would pen what God wanted. So we have God's word, and the argument obviously a lot of people will draw is the Bible's written by men. Well, yeah, physically, yeah, it was. Um, uh, well, we don't even have those. I was going to say, barring the Ten Commandments, but we don't even physically have a copy of that. Because uh, you would have had the finger of God rather than the two tablets of stone. But you, you don't actually um, have those those physical uh, stone, uh, stone tablets. Uh, but we do have what was written, preserved for us. Second uh, Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter 3. Second Timothy, chapter 3. <coughs> Okay, this is Apostle Paul writing to Timothy in what is considered a pastoral epistle. So he's writing to him, speaking to him concerning, in particular, his gift or his calling. And then in chapter 3, he starts off that knowing this, or this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And he's going to give a description of the type of injustices and crazy things that are going to happen in the last days. Get down to verse 14, and here's his admonishment in light of the fact that you're going to be in perilous times in these last days. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned uh, and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. In other words, despite the fact that you have all this going around and happening, uh, you continue. In other words, you remain steadfast and what you've been taught, what you've learned, um, knowing whom you've learned them from. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, uh, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All right, so, tells him remains, you know, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and then knowing from whom you've learned them. Um, we know from an earlier chapter that he was taught by his mother and his grandmother that it's not referencing that in particular. In context it would be that the things he's learned, he's learned from the scriptures. Uh, not only that he learned as a child, but the fact that they were given by God. In other words, God instructed him. He realized, he made a connection that that which I've learned was instructed to me by the Lord. Now, yeah, he would have used human vessels to do so, but the fact is, this instruction is coming from God. And then he goes on to just plainly state is that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um... <clears throat> Inspiration. What is that? Mm -hmm. What does that mean, sir? Uh, I know I'm just visiting today. But I think God put me here. This is this is amazing. I have uh, I've never seen you guys again, but uh, uh, I'm just visiting from out of state. But I I actually this this subject you're on this morning. I, I actually teach uh, at, a, at a seminary level, and so oh. it, it's amazing. It, I just I praise the Lord. I, I praise I praise the Lord for your stand for King James also by the way. But, but you know there, there's there's three different theories of, of inspiration that that you know people might say that the first you know people just think of what we call natural inspiration. You know the same way we would you know I, I might go out and look at a beautiful sunset and I'm inspired to write a beautiful beautiful poem or something like that. You know we're we're familiar with that. And then there, then there's a, a mechanical theory of inspiration where you know where, where we would say that you know that God you know said Paul write these words you know thus saith the Lord and and, it, and it's a very mechanical and we, we know that's not exactly right because uh, you know the, each writer wrote in his own words you know, the, the in, in the Gospel of Luke he writes a medical doctor.
Dr. Wood. He uses terms that's only found in the medical field. Uh, other people wrote in the same way that they, you know, were. But, but we know that the Bible is divinely inspired. That is that, that God, just like you read in 2 Peter, you know, God moved upon men. And as they were moved, they wrote. But, but yet the, the Holy Spirit protected them and, and kept, kept His work perfect. But, but yet allowed, you know, the, the humans to write in their own words, but but it's divine words that came directly from God and and, uh, and moved upon them. So sorry for the sorry for the lengthy answer. No, 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 that's, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up as far as the different types of uh, what we would term inspiration. Uh, the expression God breathed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Li literally, it, it's it's a compound word in Greek. It's a compound word. It's uh, uh, it's theos and nupsis, or pneumatos, basically. So it's like Spirit, it's like God, Spirit, so you put together, it's like God breathes. So the idea is that this it, it, its origin is from God. So God communicated His Word. Um, it, it's, it originates from Him, from, out of, from, from, from in, within Him. Um, in certain instances, I would say it was... Mechanical, not in everyone. Oh, the only reason I say that, not uh, you know, to argue, but like as far as yeah. you have, um, well, <laughs> yeah, Moses in particular <laughs> on the mount uh, when he was given, and then you have also Jeremiah in particular whenever you had the scroll that was yeah. destroyed, and then you had. His his, um, mm -hmm. his penman. Uh, okay, let's start another one, and then you add your men here. Do this. Mm -hmm. So, but by yeah, so you have maybe just a handful of instances on that, but not very many. But and but not all of it was given like that. Yeah. And it was because God moved. God moved the men. And you have well, like in uh, Hebrews one, you know, where it talks about you know, in the past there are forefathers. Uh, uh, God spoke through the prophets you know, yeah. in, in various ways. You know, different. You know, diverse ways and all that. Uh, I'm not paraphrasing, but but so that there were times where you know men, men of God in the Old Testament, you know, God spoke through them, and, and that they they were to say only what God told them to say, and, and, and that's the only time they were even spoke. So uh, you know, that was a very mechanical method back then of speaking to the people. That's that's how God spoke. But in these latter days, it continues. He has spoken to us through His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and. It goes on uh, that you know that this this is how we get our divine inspiration today is through God's precious word, and, and, uh, and He has preserved it. Uh, Amen. Yeah, sure. Uh, he states here that he learned. Uh, I guess go back on top. Timothy learned the truth, and he learned it from Scripture. He, obviously, he learned it from his mother and his grandmother, who taught it from him from as a child. But he learned it from Scripture, and he learned it from God, basically. And that he states here that it's profitable. It's given by God, and it's mm -hmm. profitable. There's profit to it. Uh, I mean, it, it goes without saying, obviously, we know that God's Word is profitable. But God is the one that, uh, where, from where truth originates. His Word is true. Okay. Um... He already kind of addressed some of the erroneous views of inspiration, and that being, it's not human genius. In other words, it's not like Shakespeare being inspired uh, with, with poetry. Uh, it's not illumination. It's not illumination, basically meaning enlightenment. In other words, you are maybe unaware of the truth that you come across when you're reading, and all of a sudden it's like, boom, the light comes on, and you now have an understanding of what a truth is, whereas maybe before you weren't ready for it, or for whatever reason you were closed off, it just it didn't, it, you didn't have an understanding of a, of, a, of a truth or certain truths, and then it's like the light comes on, and now you have understanding, and God gives that, but that's not inspiration. Uh, and it's not uh, partial, and what I mean by that is, th this is, <laughs> This seems more like uh, when you're dealing with evolutionists, um, but it's not exclusive to that. And that is that it's how some people would say that it's only accurate 
or it's only good for matters of faith, but it not when you're dealing with science or when you're dealing with uh, biology or when you're dealing with any other uh, matter that might be addressed. Now, the Word of God uh, isn't primarily uh, whatever a science textbook, but it does contain scientific uh, content, historical content, and it is extremely accurate in these matters that are brought up or that are mentioned uh, in that. So when we come across, uh, in particular I'm thinking Job, but not only exclusive to Job, um, but you can, which you can throw the whole, throughout the whole scripture, really. Um, the thing is, it's not how what the evolutionists or how Bible deniers would say that, well, you know, that's, that's good for you, that's nice that you have that as a crutch. Um, but, you know, we'll rely on, you know, that which is true, um, you know, what we can observe with our eyes. And at, at the end of the day, um, when you come to the Word of God and the fact of not just truth overall, but even just of truth of God, um, it's always going to be a faith issue. Okay. I know that might bother some, but the fact is, it's always it's at, at the at the root, at the crux. It's always a faith issue. Um, in other words, without God is impossible, to, or without faith is impossible to please. And for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently mm -hmm. seek him. Um, you know, and the fact is, at best, um, well, we have a lot more verifiable evidence um, with regard to a number of things regarding truth stated in scripture and truth of God uh, but this, this is going to sound bad this is going to sound heretical but anybody that comes to God you're going to come to it on the basis of the fact that okay it, these are just yeah these are words in a book and that's what they are they're words in a book right? now mind you they're supernatural words from a supernatural God, you know, uh, so they're obviously of supernatural origin, uh, and they contain timeless truths that are not isolated simply just to the area of quote unquote religion or faith. Um, it's truth. Uh, it's, tr it's, it's truth on which to stake your life upon. And the fact is, anybody coming to God that wants, I guess you could say, concrete evidence, prove to me, give me a token, I guess you could say, as some people would say, of whether or not this is true or not, you're gonna, you're, you, everybody's gonna come to God the same way, and that it's, it's by faith. And the unbeliever wanting, I guess you could say, evidence, now granted, God demonstrates himself, I mean, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, you have Holy Spirit conviction. Uh, you have a testimony witness of changed life of believers, countless believers. And you have at least, what, 6,000 years, maybe more of human, you know, recorded human history of God's interaction with mankind. Uh, and so, you know, your faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So your confidence is strengthened by you objectively going to the Word of God and obviously building and reading on the fact of how God interacted with man, and you'll see his character shine throughout the whole of it. And you know that's what you stake your, your confidence on, uh, as in Hebrews, where he says that by two immutable things by which it was impossible for God to lie, uh, that he gave as an anchor to the soul, uh, soul both short and steadfast in Hebrews 6, and that being the two immutable things by which it is impossible for God to lie, being his character and his word. In other words, his word being what he says, and then his character being his ability to back up what he says, who he actually really is. Uh, well, okay. Thou hast magnified thy name, or thy word above all thy name. So in other words, um, the idea there is, this is going to sound silly, but if you just read it like that, most people think, wow, his word is so important that it's above his name. In other words, think of through, through that logically. He's saying, most people take it and read it and say, what he says is more important than who he is. All right? 
that's the conclusion you come to if you're, if you're be honest. But the thing is, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, uh, it's a Hebraism. It's that uh, his his name is the foundation, or is this the building upon which his word stands? So in other words, who he is, it's not it's not him being hypocritical and saying, okay, how we would as humans say, like you know, do as I say, not as I do, but rather what he says is founded upon who he is. So his his word is only as good as his character is. Does that make sense? So if his word is true, it's because his character is true. If his word is steadfast, it's because his steadfastness of character and the integrity of it. The integrity of his word is only as valid as his, his, his character as far as who he is. So his word is magnified above all his name is that his word is magnified, yes. It's founded basically on him, his character, his integrity, who he is. And so his word is only obviously going to be as good as his character, his integrity. And we have, obviously, again, as I stated before, 6,000 years plus of human history of his interaction and his exposing who his character really is and that he's true, he's right, he's perfect, he's just, he's holy. And you can go on all day with regard to his attributes. And... Um, for this. Um, he promised, okay, it's understood with Peter and with Timothy that he had given his word and it was a supernatural origin that he gave it, but they had it. Okay, now, he didn't, with the exception of probably in, in, in Peter, because he did, he did give, but he didn't use the word preservation. Okay, you could say, some, somebody might want to argue, well, he didn't express it. He didn't expressly state, oh, I was going to preserve it as well. But the fact is, they had it. In other words, um, what good would his word be if we didn't have it? In other words, what good would his, and it seems kind of blasphemous to say, but the fact is, what good would his giving his word be, uh, well, especially for us today, if we didn't know we had it? Really, we wouldn't. It kind of undermines our faith in Him, and that's really what Satan's trying to do, and that's really what the world's trying to do. In that, um, He gave it, but understood in the fact that He gives it is that He's going to keep it. And I need the Word of God because it's truth. I need the Word of God. Uh, because as he stated to Timothy that it's profitable uh, for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And he gives a specific purpose that the man of God may be perfect. Uh, and that's not without fault or error. That is, he should be what he should be. In other words, the, the idea of the fitness term is that he's who he should be. Uh, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So God has, when he saves us, a specific determined plan and purpose for our individual lives that he wants to see carried out and he gives and has given and is keeping has kept and is keeping his word so that we would build our lives on it so that we would see that purpose fulfilled does it make sense okay um, there's a little different <laughs> way to approach as far as okay why we use the King James Bible um, I didn't address this. I'm, I'm, this is all introductory and foundational as far as just why introducing to the series. Um, we are going to address not just preservation, but also in particular the history of the English Bible, which will be two weeks from now. Well, three weeks from now, I'm sorry, because first we're going to look at transmission of the Old Testament. The Bible is 66 books compiled, okay, so it's 66 individual writings of books that were compiled over a great span of years by 40, over 40 different authors. Um, and there's two divisions within it. Uh, well, there's more than that, depending on how you look at it, but the thing is, is you have what would be considered Old Covenant, New Covenant, Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, you have, within the Old Testament, uh, how God transmitted, preserved that, and then we'll look at the New Testament. With regard to translation issue, 
um, just so we have a heads up. It's not usually an issue of how, even though that will be addressed. Uh, we'll be looking at dynamic equivalency, which is basically communicating of the thought rather than the actual word, uh, as, as opposed to formal equivalency. But also uh, the fact that um, it's really the New Testament portion that is argued. Um, in other words, there for the New Testament are families of manuscripts from which most of your modern translations are derived. And that's really where the crux of the argument is. Um, the family of manuscripts from which we derive the, just simply the New Testament portion for the, the translation would, uh, is where the divergence is. And that is you have what was considered uh, the received family of, of manuscripts as opposed to what would be the critical uh, family of manuscripts. And the critical family of manuscripts really came into being about 1881 to 1885. Mm -hmm. Now, those were two separate manuscripts uh, that were hodgepodge, I guess you could say, for lack of a better term, into a new manuscript altogether that hadn't existed before to that time. And then from then, it's been revised and revised and revised. And that's usually that where most, though not all, of the newer translations come from, as opposed to what the received family of manuscripts would have been, uh, which would have been any, anything eight, prior to 1881. And not exclusively to English, even though we're looking at the King James in particular, because we're an English-speaking congregation, but it is, uh, if you look at history, or the history of the Reformation, any of the reformers, uh, Luther in particular, uh, was criticized greatly for uh, I don't, I don't care for the man personally, but that's a different, <laughs> different topic. Uh, that's a whole other subject. But um, he did translate the Bible, and then him in particular, he did translate the Bible in what would have been common German. And so uh, he wasn't the only one, by the way, but his translation into German uh, was actually still pretty much being used today. Uh, and a lot of the other reformers that had made translations would have only had that manuscript or had that family of manuscripts, the received family of manuscripts. Though there might have been availability to a few of the others, but the fact is, by and large, it would have been just the received family of manuscripts. So all your, if you look at the foreign language translations that are, um, it, well, you, there's even ones that predate the Reformation, but a lot of them, as far as here in Western civilization, is going to the Reformation. Um, they would have done it from that received family. So anything prior to that, you, you have to argue just by logic. It's like, well, what about them then? If with the newer manuscripts that are, I guess, whatever, technically predating or older, if that family is supposed to be the, the better sources or the better, the better text from which uh, we're to translate from, what about all the others that didn't have that prior? Where do they stand? Uh, so you. We're, we'll be looking at that as the, the series goes on. All right. One, does anybody have any questions? I know there's a lot of information that seemed like kind of jumble, but like, does anybody have any questions? Seriously, I mean, you can ask. Yes. <coughs> how, how many uh, translations of the King James? Is there three? No, there's seven. Huh? Seven. Seven? Yeah. Well. One translation with six revisions. It's technically a revision, not really a translation, a retranslation. It's, it's a, what's more of a revision. There were six revisions following the original from 1611. Oh, how do we know that the that they were revised? Yeah. Oh, those are all Oh, yeah, because it's stated. It's, it's, it's documented. It's stated. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You were saying. Oh, say those. Exist. The, there, there are original 1611 King James yeah. that, that exists today, as well as the revisions. The, the following, yeah, yeah, the following every, every yeah. revision that there was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We don't. Well, I didn't talk to. You know, I didn't touch upon this in this. I thought you meant. You list. know that yeah, they had written first, and then they had six revisions, and then we've gotten the King James was done. 
In the 1611, no. No. grammatical errors, there were punctuation issues that had to be fixed, and then some of the spelling has also been updated yeah. um, from the original. Uh, one of one of the uh, interesting ones, one of the printers, they were they were fined like ten thousand pounds or whatever because they eliminated the word "not" from the Eighth Commandment. <laughs> That thou shalt commit. Yeah, I was about to say, they <laughs> <they're, they're laughs> messed up with the commandments. Yeah, there are only a few of those printed. Here, you know, the printing's heavily fine for that. Yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful it's, study. I, I wish I could be here for your whole presentation. But, uh, you know, the main thing for us from here is I, I used to be in the camp coming from a, uh, a church that, that didn't, you know, that didn't preach King James only. <laughs> That, and, I, and I used to, I used to not, and I, I thought, well, what's the difference? You know, it's very minor differences, and I thought all this, but but the, the more I've studied and learned and, and, uh, and all, that there's a reason why, and it, it's not just because we want to be, you know, hard and difficult to get along with. It's just that, you know, the, the King James was translated from what we call the majority text. You know, there's over five thousand, there's over five thousand texts that, that they drew from, and that all uh, that all agree. The, the, the newer translations, like you said, since 1881, is based on the, the minority text. There, there's, there, it's just, it's not even really a text. It's just, it's just you know, pieces of scrolls and, and, and things. But, but there's only six or seven of them that they found. The, the other thing, remember, the, the, the minority text all came out of Alexandria, Egypt, which is, and there, there's a lot of other non-canonical books that were found at the same time. Uh, a, lot, a lot of all these new, uh, you know, things that are not accepted as, as being inspired. Um, and so, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a wonderful study, and, and uh, any, any, any Bible student that really wants to dig into it will find. My, my biggest issue, you, you, talk, you, you can have someone that has anything other than King James and ask them to turn to some verses of Scripture that their Bibles don't have them. You know, the New King James has left out uh, a dozen verses that, that are very, very, uh, well, why would they leave out, you know, parts of God's Word? And then, and then why would they change references to the blood? And, and just there's just so many things that is, uh, I mean, I, they're, they're not the same. You, 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 we think, well, they just took out the these and thous. They didn't take out the these, just the these and thous. They, well, they literally have changed God's Word. And, uh, and I believe, like you, that God has preserved His Word through, you know, and I, I believe the King James is the best we have today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, it's probably over it's not, since church starts in two minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're dismissed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>